I'd like to thank all of you for being here this morning, and I know that all of you are like myself. You're looking so forward to hearing Robbie, and uh, so thankful to have him with us this morning. We'll uh, go ahead and, and, and get started this morning and let him take the pulpit. He's going to do our Bible study class, and he'll do our, our sermon, and I get to rest. And so, and y'all get to rest. <laughs> that, that's a good thing. But anyway, uh, if everything is said and done, did you have anybody to start us this morning? Short prayer, if you will. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given. We thank you so much for the start of our meeting, and we ask for uh, good success, and we ask for good health and, and good feelings for Robbie, Lord, and, and give him everything he needs to be able to do what he has come here to do, and that's to preach your word. And we ask this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Robbie. It's all yours. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Now that was some better. Open your Bible to the 23rd Psalm. Some of the most dynamic literature that's ever been penned is found in the 23rd Psalm. And as you turn to the 23rd Psalm, story is told of an old country preacher, his congregation sent him on a vacation. It happened to be a cruise. And on this cruise, he's there in his bibbed overalls, and, uh, and on this ship, on this same cruise, there was a world-famous, world-renowned orator. And so when the vacationers learned that there was a world-famous orator, and a country preacher on this cruise ship sailing the high seas together, they wanted to know who would be the best reader, who could read the best. A challenge was made, and both men accepted the challenge. The night came for the reading. The hall was filled, and uh, the MC stepped to the microphone, and he said he introduced both men, and he said, the text that has been selected is Psalm 23. So the orator went first, and he read the psalm, and every word just rolled off of his tongue and lips. His poise and his diction were perfection. And at the end of the reading, he received a standing ovation. Now it's the old preacher's turn. He stepped to the microphone and his bibbed overhauls, and he began to read, The Lord is my shepherd. And thus he read, and when he finished, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And an old man stood in the back of the hall and shouted out, What made the difference? The MC stepped to the microphone and said, The first man knew the psalm. The second man knew the shepherd. You've got to know the shepherd. Psalm 23 is a shepherd's psalm. Now, a shepherd's responsibility was basically twofold. Or excuse me, threefold. He was to lead, he was to feed, and he was to protect. Psalm 22 could be captioned, the good shepherd. Psalm 23, the great shepherd. Psalm 24, the chief shepherd. Psalms 22 through 24 are the shepherd psalms. Now the seven Old Testament Hebrew names for God are represented in Psalm 23. Six are by representation, and the seventh one that we'll mention is mentioned in Psalm 23 and 1. Jehovah Jireh is represented. You remember when Abraham had bound Isaac, and Isaac wanted to know, Father, where is the sacrifice? Abraham said, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Did not David say in this psalm, I shall not want? And then there's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord will heal or restore, Exodus 15, 26. Did not David say in this psalm, he restores my soul? 
Then there's Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is our peace. Judges 6.24 did not David say in this in this psalm, He prepares a table before me or for me in the presence of mine enemies? Then there's Jehovah Tishkenu, the Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah twenty three six. Did not David say He leads me in paths of righteousness? And then there's Jehovah Shema, the Lord is here, Ezekiel 48, 35. Did not David say, for thou art with me? Then there's Jehovah Nisai, the Lord is our banner, Exodus 17, 8 through 15. Did not David say, he leads me beside still waters? And the name that is actually mentioned in this psalm, not by representation, but in actuality, is Jehovah Ra'ah, the Lord, my shepherd, Psalm 23, 1. And just as God was all that Israel needed, so Jesus Christ is to his sheep all they would ever need. As a little child said when misquoting this psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, what more shall I want? Now this psalm has offered comfort for 3,000 years. It's been read at funeral homes, beside sick beds and death beds and hospital rooms, nursing homes, and beside open graves. In Hebrews 13 and verse 20, it informs us today that Jesus is the great shepherd who cares for the sheep. Now the God of peace that brought from the dead Jesus Christ our Lord, that great and great shepherd and, and uh, uh, shepherd of the sheep. Uh, Hebrews 13 verse 20. And then we're reminded of 1 Peter 5 and 7. Casting all your care upon Him, knowing what? That He cares for us. The Lord was David's shepherd, and He's ours as well. And Peter said in 1 Peter 2 and 25, You have returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. You see, we're His sheep, and we follow Him. And He ministers to us. David said in Psalm 95 and 7 that you're the people of his pastor and the sheep of his hand. And Jesus said in Matthew 20 and 28 that the Son of Man came not to be ministered to or to be served, but to minister or to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, Jesus died for us all. But that's not the end of the story. The devil wanted to put a period. But three days later, God changed the period to a comma and said the story is to be continued. Romans 1 verse 4. He's declared to be the Son of God. How, Paul? By power in that God hath raised him from the dead. Philippians 3 and 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. If you don't get anything else out of this lesson, hey church, get this. Christ is at God's side, but He's on my side. And that's Psalm 118 and verse number 6. You see, He's the shepherd, the great shepherd, the great high priest. Now, I shall not want is the theme of this psalm. Now, if you're, if you're still open to the psalm, and hopefully you are, I shall not want for rest and refreshment. Notice verse 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. I shall not want for restoration and righteousness. Notice verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His sake. I shall not want for provision and peace in the midst of mine enemies. Verse 5, or, or yes, verse 4. Verse 5. 
He says, Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. I shall not want for protection in time of trouble. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. I shall not want for a home to go to at the end of the day. Verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now let's go back. And verse by verse, let's unpack this, the most beautiful piece of literature that's ever been penned. Now in these six short verses, David refers to himself 17 times. And he refers to the Lord 15 times in these short verses. If you'll go down through and count the pronouns, I did, you'll find that to be the truth. The first four verses of this psalm tells us of the Lord as being a leader, chief of the greatest army on the face of the earth. I'll take what I want. But no, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, when David acknowledged himself as being a sheep, you see, sheep are not very smart, are they? They cannot find the best grass. They cannot find the best water. They wander off. They're careless. And uh, they have no uh, defense mechanism. I mean, if a lion or a bear or a wolf sees a ship, uh, a sheep in the, in the wilderness, he doesn't see a threat. He sees dinner. His lamb chops for dinner tonight. And so Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. And shepherds held a high place in Jewish society. Though the Jews, the Pharisees, they didn't hold Jew, Jewish shepherds in high society. As a matter of fact, they wrote in their traditional literature that the shepherds were so untrustworthy that they would not even be allowed to testify in court. That was Jewish estimation to the shepherds in that day. But when Jesus was born, who did the she who who got the visit uh, from the angels? It was the shepherds, right? God didn't go to the temple to announce the birth. He didn't go to Herod's palace to announce the birth. He didn't go to the religious establishment to announce the birth. He went to humble shepherds. Shepherds held a tremendous spot in the heart of God in that day. And then in verse 2 of this psalm, notice, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. David didn't find it easy to take pause in life. He was a go-getter. He didn't find it easy to stop and smell the roses. Somebody that burns the candle at both ends, the problem is you'll burn out twice as fast. I know preachers that never knew how to come apart and rest a while, and they came apart. They're no longer filling pulpits. They're working in funeral homes and they're doing various other jobs. Respectable work, nothing wrong with that. But they've left the pulpit because they burned the candle at both ends and when it met in the middle, they were burned out and they quit. David had to be made by God to take pause in life. David said, he makes me. That Hebrew is, he causes me. He made me to stretch out. And David said, in green pastures. Now there's blessings in green pastures. The first blessing that David enjoyed was nourishment. And just as a shepherd leads his sheep to fresh grass for feeding and still waters for cleansing and for quenching the thirst, so the Lord leads His people. Tender, succulent grass the sheep need. David needed nourishment, and he enjoyed that under God's leadership. We sing, where He leads me, I will follow. I'll go with Him. I'll go with Him all the way. 
Do you realize that the book of Revelation is what John saw? In Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, John saw these things. Revelation 1, verses 11 and 19, twice were told that John was told, John, what you see, write in a book. In Revelation 22 and 8, it says that John saw these things. So the book of Revelation is what John saw. Revelation 14, 4, what do you see, John? Who's going to heaven? He said, they that follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Brethren, if we'll follow the Lamb wherever he goes, we'll end up in heaven because he's gone into heaven for us. 1 Peter 3, 22. One who follows the Lord will not lack any spiritual nourishment. Today we have under shepherds, what I uh, term for this material anyway, in the church called elders. They're under the great shepherd. And they are to feed and to lead and to guide and to protect the church from all harm. In Acts 20 uh, and verse 28, Paul says to the elders, Take heed unto yourself over the which the Holy and to the church or the flock over the which the Holy Spirit has made the overseers. That word is episkopos. And if you broke the word down in two Greek words, it would be epi, which means over, it's a preposition which means over, and skopion, which means to see. Now, what English word do you hear in skopion? Scope, right? What do you do with a scope? You see. And you, if everything is tuned the way that it ought to be, then you put the crosshair on the sweet spot, pull the trigger, and it's meat in the freezer. And that's what elders do. They're constantly overseeing, overscoping, looking for the wolves in sheep's clothing, looking for the men that might want to get into this pulpit and teach you something that is not true. That's the responsibility. And the food for the soul is the Word of God, 1 Peter 2 and 2. Then back in our psalm, in verse 23... Psalm 23, that is verse 2b and 3a. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. A second blessing that comes from the Lord's leading is spiritual restoration. As a shepherd leads his sheep to placid waters for rest and cleansing and refreshment, so the Lord refreshes the soul. Do you realize sheep will not drink from running water? Their wool is heavy. If they get swept away, they fall in, get swept away, they're pulled under. They don't have the strength to surface again. So they drink from still waters. And here the lesson is clear. The Lord provides forgiveness and peace for those who follow Him. Isaiah 43, 25, Isaiah said of God, I even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake and will not remember thy sins. Micah 7, 18, Who is a God like unto thee that pardons iniquity? The 103rd Psalm, verse 12, He removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. Hebrews 8, 12, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and of their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Then in Hebrews 10, 12, But this man, after he had made one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Hebrews 10, 17 says, That of their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Then back in our psalm, I know we are speeding through this, but I've got 50 minutes of material to do and 30 minutes. So Psalm 23, verse 3, the latter part. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His sake. The same author, the Spirit, the same penman, David, penned in Psalm 5 and 8, Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness. You see, a good shepherd knows the right path in which to lead and to bring the sheep home safely. 
so too. The Lord loses none of his sheep, but he guides them in the right way. In the 107th Psalm, verse 7, the Bible says, He led them forth by the right way, that they may go to a city of habitation. Friends, if you're led by the Lord, you're not going to be led to the wrong church. If you're led by the Lord, you're not going to be led to wrong worship. If you're led by the Lord, you're not going to be led to the plans of salvation that men make in the fickle minds of men. He does so partly, the Bible says, for His reputation. It's for His name's sake. Now, where God guides, He provides. In Isaiah 40 and verse 11, He shall feed His flock like a shepherd. And then the latter part says, He shall lead them that are young. He feeds and He leads. Verse number 4 of this psalm, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The fourth blessing that David found from the Lord's leading is protection. The poet said, But though darkness hide, he is there to guide by the touch of his hand on mine. They cannot shell his temple nor dynamite his throne. They cannot bomb his city, nor rob him of his own. They cannot take him captive, nor strike him deaf and blind, nor starve him to surrender, nor make him change his mind. They cannot cause him panic, nor cut off his supplies. Though, though all the world be shattered, and his Truth remains the same. His righteous law is still potent and Father still His name. Though we face war and struggle and feel their golden rod, we know above confusion there always will be God. And that's a lesson we need to learn early in life. Friends, if you find yourself in a deep valley of darkness, shadow of death, verse 4, you need not fear, for a shadow cannot harm you. The shadow of this building cannot fall upon you. The shadow of a car cannot strike you down. The shadow of a dog cannot bite you. And death to the faithful devotee of Jesus Christ is just a shadow. You might be in a dark valley this morning. A dark valley of depression. A financial strait a family problem, a teenager problem, an employer-employee problem, a marriage problem, an in-law or an outlaw problem. And maybe you're in a problem in a deep valley because of some choice that you've made. But here's the good news. God has given you now to take care of that problem. Now, He might not give you tomorrow. He might not give you till this evening. But He's given you right now. And the Lord will be with you, and He'll protect you if you will let Him. The rod and the staff of the shepherd was His equipment to protect the sheep in such dangerous situations. And David was comforted by the presence of the Lord. Believers are never in situations that the Lord is not aware of, for He never leaves and He never forsakes. Hebrews 13, 5. Gary? We'll never face a situation where the Lord says, I didn't see that coming. Or where the Lord scratches His head and says, What on earth am I going to do? I don't know what I... No, God is bigger than any problem that we face. The problem that we face is ourselves. We turn to everything else but God. God never goes to sleep. He, he is always awake. He's always at the switch. Psalm 121, verse 3. Nextly, the second point is from verse 5. We've looked at the leadership of the Lord. Now the Lord as a provider. Psalm 23, 5. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runs over. Now in this scene of Psalm 23, 5, the scene changes. We've been in a pasture field in the first four verses. We've been underneath the shepherds uh, leading in a pasture field and he's feeding and he's refreshing and he's restoring us in a pasture field. Now we've changed the scene to a banquet hall. 
where a generous host provides lavish hospitality. And under this imagery, the psalmist enjoyed the Lord's provision. What was comforting to David, though, was that this was in the presence of his enemies. You see, despite the impending danger, the Lord spread out a table for David and God provided for him. Matthew 20, 28, Jesus, he serves us. He did not come to be served. And in Luke 19 and 10, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And in Matthew 6, 33, he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. What things? Well, the food, shelter, and clothing that was under discussion there in Matthew chapter 6. So, despite the danger, God was with David, and he knew it. And the image of the anointing of the head with oil, which was refreshing and soothing, harmonizes with the concept of a gracious host welcoming someone into his home. And in view of the table and the oil, David knew that his lot in life, that is his, that is his cup, was abundant blessing from the Lord, and it would overflow. Read John 10 and 10. Number Three, the response of faith is found in verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David realized that the Lord's good, merciful, loyal love, the word for mercy, where he says goodness and mercy, the word for mercy, kesed, means steadfast love and loyalty. And David knew God's good, steadfast love and loyal love would go with him everywhere throughout all of his life. He said goodness and mercy, Gary. I need goodness for my needs and I need mercy for my faults. And David said, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You see, God's blessings on his people remain with them no matter what circumstances uh, you may be going through. Have you ever read the 107th Psalm? If you do, today, go home and read it. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to quote one verse, and it's found the exact wording in four verses in Psalm 107. 107, 8. 15, 21, and 31. You find the exact phrase. Here it is. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Get that, folks. Praising the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works. The 116th Psalm, verse number 12. What shall I render unto the Lord for all His benefits toward me? The 116th Psalm, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. So David concluded, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The house of the Lord refers here to the tabernacle or the sanctuary. And for the rest of his life, that is the Hebrew, the length of his days, he would enjoy full communion with the Lord. In earlier days, he had his time in sin. In fact, the Hebrew verb translated, I will dwell, I will dwell, verse 6, in the house of the Lord, I will dwell, conveys the idea of returning. And the same verb is translated, He restores my soul in Psalm 23 and verse 3. Perhaps the psalmist was in some way separated from the sanctuary and its full and the full benefits of uh, that in a spiritual nature. His meditation on the Lord's leading and his provisions prompted David to recall the communion that he had in the presence of the Lord in the sanctuary in better days. There are five lessons that I want us to learn and they take about 20 minutes so I'm just going to state them. I'll not develop them. When you read this psalm, here's what we learn. Number one, we learn that God is always good. I wish I could develop that for you. Number two, we learn with God, peace is always available. Number three, we learn with God as our shepherd, there is nothing to fear.
Number four, we learn with God there is nothing lacking. And number five, we learn home is wherever God is. Brethren, I'll close with these words. You've got to know the shepherd. You've been a marvelous audience. It's 1031, and I think that's my time. Is that right?